Look at that. Isn't that a great layout? You son of a gun. This campaign is no good. No good. Darren and Larry, the original Mad Men on Bewitched. Hi, I'm John Malice, and welcome to this edition, a special edition of Connect With Me. Today, we're going to be talking to the father of the B-1 bomber. That bomber, that military plane, is really mostly responsible for winning the Cold War here in the United States. The father of the B-1B, we're back with our program in just a moment. I'm sure most of you who watch this program on a regular basis remember the Cold War between the United States and Russia. That wasn't all that long ago. It was back in the 80s, as you recall. Well, today on this program, we're talking about history and a local guy that went to Edison High School. He graduated. He was a star football player. He went to Fresno State. He is often referred to as the father of the B-1 bomber. That plane almost single-handedly won the Cold War for the United States when Russia was certainly enemy number one. What is the B-1 bomber? We'll take a look and a listen to this video. For 25 years it has served as a formidable deterrent and an indispensable warfighter and now its future has never been brighter. I'm Colonel Rob Gass, commander of the 7th Bomb Wing and this is a V-1 bomber. Simply amazing, the B-1B is a supersonic military plane that almost single-handedly won the Cold War, as I said, back in the 80s when the U.S. was at odds with Russia. Everybody thought they were going to go to war. When President Carter was in office, our government stopped the development of the B-1. Enter Ronald Reagan into office, who told the nation at the time, a nationwide audience, that the U.S. was vulnerable without the B-1B. So the U.S. began building it and building it and to the tune of 100 B-1Bs, military might that flies 200 feet off the ground at more than 600 miles per hour. This supersonic plane can carry 125 pounds of payload. It's capable of carrying 22 air-launched cruise missiles weighing 4,000 pounds each. And you know what that means? It means that those missiles can take out 22 different cities at one time with just one launch. The B-1B is still being used right now, 27 years later. It is the weapon of choice by the military in Afghanistan, and it certainly was in the war in Iraq as well. Live in our studio right now is Sam Icabellis, the father of the B-1B. He was the deputy chairman and the executive vice president of North American Aircraft Operations, the company that built the warplane back in the 80s. He graduated from Columbia Elementary, 1947 Edison High, 1952 Fresno State with a mechanical engineering degree, 1963 a master's degree from UCLA. He was also a football player. He is Sam Icabellis for the life of me. I don't know why they don't have a statue of him at Edison High, at Fresno State. He helped stop the Cold War in the 80s between the United States and Russia when everybody thought perhaps there might be nuclear war involved. We're back with our program with the local man that helped stop the Cold War in just a moment. Frigid Air. We introduce the first home freezer. The first pulsator agitator washer. And now we introduce the Frigid Air Orbit Clean Dishwasher, designed with a unique wash arm that gives you four times more water coverage for a consistently better clean. 
Frigidaire, over 90 years of legendary innovation. See the full line of Frigidaire appliances at Ventura TV Electronics and Appliances. We all remember Ronald Reagan in office back, of course, in the 1980s and uh, the, the head-on collision, near collision, the United States versus Russia. Everybody thought it was going to be nuclear war or some kind of conventional war at the time. But enter Ronald Reagan, enter the B-1 bomber, and certainly today we're going to enter Sam Icabella. Sam, good to see you. How are you? Fine, fine. Thank oh, you very much, right. John. You know, I want to put up a picture, a very intimidating picture of the nose cone of the B-1B bomber. We're going to take a look at it right up here on the monitor. There it is. Very intimidating. They're still using it today in Afghanistan, Sam. Yes, they are. Yeah, they are. And why do you think it's the weapon of choice? Well... In Afghanistan, it can take off, go up to high altitudes, move its wings forward, and stay up there for hours, literally hours. While it's up there, anybody on the ground, any of our soldiers, sergeants uh, that see a problem, they can call and talk directly to the captain of that airplane and tell them what kind of a problem they have. For instance, if they see the enemy uh, gathering some artillery, which would become a threat, and uh, the airplane could be 90 miles away, and uh, at speeds it can travel, 900 miles per hour, 15 miles per minute, it can be there and pinpoint weapons and precisely uh, with the GPS system that they have in the, in the military person, a sergeant, what have you, could call and tell them the, the, the position and the uh, coordinates of the target. And then that target's gone in minutes. In a matter of minutes, yeah. Now, you know what's going on, a very timely issue with North Korea right now. We don't know if any of these threats are coming from President uh, Kim Jong-un of North Korea. We don't know if he's going to follow through with any of these alleged threats. If he does and the United States decides to respond, would you venture to say that the United States would enter the B-1B in a fight against North Korea? Well, that's hard for me to answer that question. However, I have these, these thoughts. Uh, first of all, um, will they use, will they look at it rationally? Uh, the Russians were rational. And they realized that when our power was equal to theirs, it was a, a mutually assured destruction. So each party knew that they could destroy the other. Therefore, we had a peaceful uh, Cold War. However, in North Korea, they not, may not be even as rational as the Iranians are. They might be worse. So what Do you may think happen? they're aware of the B-1B, as aware as Russia was back in the 80s? Well, they have to be because it's, it, it's, it's the predominant uh, surface weapon that the Air Force has. Yeah, and it's, it avoids radar. There's no question yes, about it. Yes, it can, and, and, and it's... Uh, uh, something that I believe this, if the North Koreans invade South Korea, and answer your question, they will bring the B-1s there. Because mm -hmm. it's the, it's the, the, the Air Forces, it, 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 they call it the surface dominant aircraft. That means it's the lowest cost per weapon on foreheads in our enemy if it's ground troops. I want to take you to the monitor here, if you can turn around just yeah. slightly. We're going to take you back to the early 80s, well, mid-80s, about 1984, and uh, roll the videotape. It's you and Ronald Reagan rolling out the B-1B for the first time. Here is uh, President Reagan, uh, of course, coming off of Air Force One. Explain what we're looking at here, Sam. Yes. Pr President Reagan uh, came into the plant. And we were gathering 18,000 people to greet him in the hangar where the B-1Bs in ship number one was being assembled. And it was uh, almost finished to be rolled out. Mm -hmm. And there he is putting his hat on. 
<laughs> well, yes. yeah, we just saw uh, President Reagan okay. putting that uh, hat on. And go ahead and describe the scene there. Well, uh, he had the crowd just went wild when he put his uh, hat on his head. He waved his hair back, put the hat on, and waved to the crowd. It was a... Uh, uh, exactly uh, where did that take place? In Palmdale. Okay. Uh, we, had, we had built a million square foot facility there. In one of the largest buildings, about uh, uh, two-thirds of that in, in area, is where we were assembling the airplanes. And we were assembling, uh, uh, we'd start off with just basic parts. And by the time they moved through that 660-foot long line, two two lines, And there's an the assembly line out. right there, Sam. Yes. There it is, yes. right there. And, 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 and so he was, when, when what we did, we had the group assemble 18,000 people. And then we brought him on, and the first time they saw him is when he was on the platform. All right. How about a picture of you and Ronald Reagan together? You'll look up on that monitor there. Of course, uh, 1984, that was before the actual rollout of the B-1, yes, yes. right? Yes, he, he, he viewed the airplane for the first time uh, at that plant. What we did, he didn't know it, uh, but we had the airplane outside the hangar and so we opened the doors and when he turned around you can see the expression on his face yeah. that's the first time he saw b1b ship number one quickly how much time did you spend one-on-one -on -one with president reagan oh i was fortunate to have the opportunity i spent 45 minutes one-on-one -on -one underneath the airplane giving him technical briefings and he was very interested and very astute on what was going on and it's a, certainly a highlight of my life. All right, we're ta talking to Sam Icabellis. He is also known as the father of the B-1B that helped stop the Cold War back in the 1980s. Special program today on Connect With Me on MeTV Fresno. Back with our guest in just a moment. Nothing could be finer than to be in Carolina in the morning. Talking with Sam Icabellis of Fresno, you know, he went to Edison High, went to Fresno State. He was a great athlete, but he decided to become a mechanical engineer, helped build a B-1 B-bomber. Not only that, he has actually flown the plane. Yes, he has. Sam, that must have been an incredible <laughs> feeling, right? Incredible feeling is correct. How many times did you fly that thing? I, I, flew, I flew it twice uh, in, in, in the left seat, which is the pilot's <laughs> seat. And uh, of course, I had an expert on my right, and that was uh, Colonel Chamberlain. You did the takeoff and the landing? Oh, uh, no, okay. I can't, okay. I can't okay. claim that. But I've, didn't, okay. I've done that on a simulator. So I've, uh -huh. I've taken off, landed in fog and actually did a 360-degree roll. The airplane can <laughs> roll 360 degrees. Well, you built a pretty good one, and I want to take you back to July 4th, 1987. 36 world records yeah. were broken by Bob Chamber uh, Chamberlain. He is a lieutenant colonel, or was, in the United States Air Force, 1987. Here he is after he broke 36 world records in the B-1B. And that completes the flight. As you know, we just um, set world records in Ship 58 out over the Gulf. And uh, one thing that uh, I was telling uh, Mr. Icabellis about this airplane when he flew with me before, we were down low, uh, real low, 200 feet, flying behind a mountain. Uh, through a valley, 90 degrees of bank, 700 miles an hour, and uh, Sam, Sam was pretty impressed about all that, but he says, well, what do you think about it from an aviator? And uh, what I was trying to demonstrate to him at the time, and which I firmly believe, flying the airplane, the B-1, like that, down low at those speeds, it makes the B-1 impossible to shoot down, virtually impossible. So the Russians have a real problem, I believe. I think that they uh, could never defend against something like this. And, of course, that was Lieutenant uh, Colonel Bob Chamberlain back in 1987 talking about those 36 world records, giving you a lot of credit. Well, he did everything. He was the pilot, and uh, he arranged for that. 
And the interesting thing is, because the B-1B was a deterrent against the Russians, we made, we made those world records public. There were Russians in the officials that were monitoring the world records. And they, you made them public for a reason. You yes, wanted the Russians to know. We wanted the Russians to know that they could not successfully um, attack the United States without B-1Bs being in the air. They could not get them on the ground because a B-1B, one of the records it has broken is going from chalk release, where the brakes are released, to 10,000 feet in one minute. 59 seconds. All right. We've got a couple of minutes left in this segment. I want to quickly go through some of these photos here, these pictures. Let's put the first graphic up on the screen. It shows a comparison between the B-1B and the B-52. Explain what we're looking at there, Sam. Yes. Well, the B-52, that's a plan view of it compared to the, to the B-1B. And you can see relative to payload, the B-1B can carry 33% more than the B-52. Its radar cross-section, the big circle with the yellow in it, that's the radar cross-section of the B-52. The B-1B is but 1% radar cross-section of the B-52. So wow. they can hardly see it when it's coming in. And then you can see the payload. The payload comparison on the right, uh, the, the B-1B is a... Uh, more far superior. Far plane. superior. All right, roll a videotape there, and we're going to take a look at the B-1B. If we can, just roll it, and we're going to see this plane in action in the air. You, this thing is awesome, an amazing plane. It's refueled in the air, right? It Am can be. It can be, but it can go to the Soviet Union from takeoff on an alert without refueling. That's one of the another really? big. And how long would it take to get there? Well, it, it's still. Uh, it would fly some of it supersonically, but it's on the order of several hours. But that's not the point. When it reaches the shore of the Soviet Union, they can't see it. It's at 200 feet. You can see the payload there. The uh, 22 air-launched cruise missiles that weigh up to 4,000 pounds. That is the payload on that. Yeah, the original uh, version that we released that really scared the Jesus out of, out, of, <laughs> out of the Russians, it can carry eight of them internally and 14 underneath. And it could deliver those as it approaches the uh, coastline at 200 feet. And then those air launch cruise missiles have um, a 1,500 nautical mile range uh, uh, in their own uh, capacity so they can go off to far off scattered targets throughout the Soviet Union just one B one B all right can carry quick, 22 a quick uh, look at a couple of more graphics here before we go to break I want to put up a model picture of the B one B and compare that to um, the Russian version that's our version that's the United States version a model version which we have here on the set of the B1B bomber change it we'll go to the Russian version that's called the blackjack right that's the Russian imitation of ours yes it is and uh, you can see it's almost a direct copy of ours the wings uh, move forward and aft like ours we have both of those on the set let's go to the inscription up tight and what does the inscription say and who wrote it there it is right there Sam well the uh, the in, in the inscription says uh, to me, uh, and, and he has my title, uh, and it's from the Commander-in-Chief of the Russian Air Force, uh, General Doikin, and um, he sent that to me, and then I, in turn, sent him uh, a, this model here, a chrome right. model. Right, the model of our version of the B-1, yes. the and original. And here's his message to me. We both should be pleased that our airplanes did not have to see each other in combat. And this is after the Soviet Union had been dissolved. The inscription right. to me was written in 1993. All right, we're talking, talking with Sam Icabellis of Fresno, graduate of Edison High, Fresno State, the father of the B-1B bomber that helped stop the Cold War. Back with more of our program in just a moment. Ventura TV Appliance Center. We're the save energy, save time, save money place. The Energy Star qualified number one rated high efficiency Cabrio from Whirlpool Place. You heard right. Right now, save big on select Whirlpool Cabrio laundry pairs and pay no interest when paid in full within six months. At the hometown low price, think outside the big box place. Since 1951, Ventura TV Appliance Center, we're working hard to be your place. 
All right, quickly running out of time here with Sam Icabellis. Sam, I want to roll some more videotape and what this plane did, the B-1B bomber, as we have both models here. Here's the Russian version, the U.S. version, but in Iraq, this was the weapon of choice. This thing was just amazing with the pinpoint accuracy of where these bombs landed to take out buildings down below as we're looking at this video here. Go ahead and comment if you would. Well, it, it did have uh, the, the reputation of, uh, of being very effective, uh, pinpoint accuracy, and, uh, and was there for the troops to call. They can, they, when you put the wings forward, it just loiters up there. It can stay up there 11 hours mm -hmm. over the troops, and if they need it, Without they, refueling. Without refueling. And, and a sergeant can call up, tell the cabin what they want it, and then they can deliver weapons uh, right on target. Yeah, and that video that we just saw there was in Iraq, of course, uh, the war there. All right, I want to take you back before, you know, all this took place in the 80s. I want to take you to a hangar here at our Fresno Air Terminal. It wasn't the Fresno Air Terminal then. It was a hangar, and there it is right mm -hmm. there, Hangar 1. What are we looking at right there? That's circa 1957. What yes. was going on there? North uh, American Aviation. North American Aviation had a modification center in Fresno. And the what job... Were they doing? What were they doing In there? this picture, we were modifying an F-86 interceptor into an F-86L. And the airplane, we put in several black boxes, 17 thousand feet of wiring so we can connect with a system called uh, SAGE, semi-automatic uh, ground environment so that at a headquarters, uh, a secret building in Colorado, they could determine if any Russian bombers were approaching the U.S. and they can tell a F-86L they can direct it with the instructions right to the pilot where to meet and intercept that Russian. Now, what we're looking at here is an amazing photo from 1957, an aerial view of what yeah. now is the Fresno Terminal. That hangar right there is where they were reconstructing those planes. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Okay, and then change it. This is the modern-day version of what that same area, yes. an aerial shot, looks like today. It's the yes. Fresno Airport. Yes. It's amazing. Oh, boy. So you've had quite a career. Let's talk a little bit about this as we have these models of the B-1B, uh, the U.S. version, the Russian version. You, I mean, you went through every phase of the Cold War. You had your hand in it. You're the father of the B-1B. But also, a lot of people don't know, you helped with the construction uh, of the, the Apollo uh, space missions, the, the moon landings, and the space shuttle. Talk about your career in those two areas. Yes, well, it was fortuitous. Um, after the F-86L program. That picture of you and yeah. Neil Armstrong, yes. the first man who landed and yeah. walked on the moon, of course. Uh, uh, go ahead and continue. Yes, well, what happened was I was able to be transferred from the Rocketdyne uh, to the Rocketdyne division making rocket engines. And we made rocket engines for ICBMs. We made rocket engines for the, uh, for the Saturn V. And I met uh, Neil Armstrong over 40 years ago. Uh, and I've been a friend with him. Uh, How well did you know him? Well, I knew him. I saw him, a I would say, two times a year for four or five days at a time. We were in a, uh, a, a professional club together. And uh, What significant hand did you have in the Apollo space mission, specifically Apollo 11, the first moon landing? Yes. Well, on that program, I, I was at Rocketdyne, and I helped. Uh, decide how many engines should we have on the booster and how many on the second stage. Uh, help with the uh, technical development of the, uh, the, see the five engines on the booster of a Saturn V produce 1.5 million pounds of thrust. The second stage has five engines and it produces 200,000 pounds each for Were a million pounds. Were you the project pounds. manager on that? Uh, no, I was in advanced programs. It was the, it well, was. What does that entail? Well, it's similar to to the uh, skunk works at Lockheed, uh, all of the. And what did you do specifically? Well, I was I was an analyst. Then I became the the, the supervisor, the group leader. Then I I ran the program. I was vice president of advanced programs for Apollo. For, for Apollo. Apollo, but then it, we were already working on the space shuttle engine. Okay. And then that was a big advancement in. You're uh, working on that in the 70s, huh? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, the. Uh, uh, we yes, but but uh, the the whole thing was that 
we were on almost at Rocketdyne. We were almost on every phase of it. Then, of course, our our space division developed a whole shuttle orbiter, and I became active on that. In fact, on uh, that first space uh, landing, the first moon landing, I should say. Was there any doubt that those astronauts would return? Or well, was there a little bit of doubt. Well, it's interesting. Interesting question. Uh, in talking to Neil, there was a time that, and I asked him the question because I heard it, and he, as a test pilot, had no problem doing the job, but down deep. He felt that it was going to be a miracle if all of the systems worked the first time. And the Saturn V was going to have to work the first time. So he didn't think that they were going to work with accuracy the first time around. He, in other words, he thought that they may in fact be stuck on the moon. Well, I can't vouch for that. I just know that he, in the back of his mind, knew that uh, the, the, the probability of success on ship number one vehicle number one with all of the new things that had to work and if the takeoff engine by the way Rocketdyne made the takeoff engine also if there's only one engine all the other ones have redundancy but when you only have one engine to take off the surface of the moon it's got to work and if it doesn't work we had no system to rescue them uh, there it was seven days estimated that they would be able to exist so that engine made by Rocketdyne had to work. It's a smaller engine, not the 1.5 million pounds or not the 200,000 pound thrust, but one that was much, much smaller to take off in the... Let's put that picture up one more time. Neil Armstrong. Oh, actually, uh, what picture are we looking at here? This is a, almost like a bunker-like situation oh, oh, yeah, in Colorado. This is what Cal circle was this? Well, th this here is 1957, and this is our first leg, in my mind, of the Cold War. Okay. And then that F-86 looks like L. a radar where you can spot oh. all the radar. It's like a radar screen. Oh, on the right, you can see the polar picture showing the USSR at the top and the U.S. below it. And that's mm -hmm. where the Russians may come in from. Okay. And then this F-86L, it has a tray of rockets beneath it. Beneath it. When was this? What circa was that? The, the picture right there was 1954. 55, 56, 57. And you worked in there? Yes. And we modified 981 F-86Ds into F-86Ls. Yes. I want that picture of Neil Armstrong again. Yes. You and Neil Armstrong. Yes. And I want to know when that picture was taken. The picture was, uh, oh, my 87, I think. Mm-hmm. 1987. Yeah, yeah, I and, think it's uh, written on there. I've forgotten. Right. And uh, 98. I, I think know. it was 1998 is yeah. what the picture says. Uh, yes, but, uh, of course, he passed away recently, yes. not too long ago. Yes. Um, and what, in your opinion, what significance uh, was it to land on the moon? How significant was it? And how significant was it that, that Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon because he was such a quiet, yeah. humble type man? Well, first of all, the significance of it. Many people don't realize, but landing on the moon was one element of the Cold War that we won. When so how was it related to the Cold War? In what, in what well, fashion? Well, it was showing the, when Sputnik went up in 1957, they had this first man-made satellite. And, and the third world countries might be thinking, well, maybe the Russians have a better system. That they beat us. Then they put the first man in space. And so that's when President Kennedy says, we're going to the moon in this decade to prove to the world that our system of government... So the landing on the moon was somewhat of a deterrent. Oh, absolutely. Russians. Oh, yeah. absolutely. So that was part of the Cold War. Yeah. So was the shuttle. So was the space station. And, and, and uh, uh, they, they, when they knew that they could not defeat the B-1B... They threw they, in the towel. They threw in the towel. <laughs> and I can quote what Russians told me. Accommodations and generals told me this. It was the B-1B that negated their first strike capability. They thought they could knock us out and we wouldn't even be able to retaliate. Great ending to the show, a great way to get out. Sam Icabellis, you gotta come back. Okay. All right, to no. me, you're an icon. And, well, uh, thank you. They need a statue of Sam Icabella somewhere in Fresno. Hey, how about Fresno State? That's gonna do it for this special edition of Connect With Me on Me TV Fresno. And we hope you have a great day. We'll see you next time.
Ready, Bo? Let's go. Dr. Shields, activated, Mr. Sulu. Automatics. And we're pushing to the limit. Make situation critical. Base of action. Can't break loose. Peace or utter destruction. It's up to you. Star Trek, Saturdays at 9, 8 central on MeTV. Brought to you by Ventura TV.